Okay, it's good to see you here today. Everybody doing good? Yeah? Amen. Yeah? Yeah. Amen. yeah. Um, <clears throat> so, in the uh, 8.30 service this morning, we had an opportunity to receive into the fellowship um, a new member. He's already a believer in Jesus Christ. He'd been baptized. And Trey, and I'm not going to tell you his last name uh, because I'm not sure how to pronounce it. <laughs> Um, But I'll tell you who he's engaged to be married to. That would be Miss Emmy Meadows. And they will be married in two weeks. Two weeks from today, they will be husband and wife, actually. And she will have his last name, and I won't know how to pronounce her last name (laughs) after that. Uh Huh? Scotera? Cotera. Yeah, there you go. (laughs) That would make it easier for all of us. Um, so uh, Trey came today, uh, desiring to join with the fellowship of this church and uh, so that he and his soon-to-be wife can begin to put their roots down here. It's really a cool moment, and it was a good teaching moment. I can't truly create it, but I do want to verbally tell it really quick. After they, I, I'd called them up just before I, I, I got into the Bible teaching, and um, we celebrated his desire to join with us. But then I invited their small group, their Sunday morning small group that they meet with, to come down and stand with them, and many of them did. And then I was able to make the point. I said this, and I'm pointing to that smaller group, this is how you really grow into the fellowship of a local church. We, we gather in big rooms like this, and we worship, which is very, very important. But if you really want to develop the kind of relationships that draw you deeper into the life and community of uh, the local church, you need a smaller group of people where you're sharing life. And it's just a really good teaching moment. And so we celebrate that. And I want to celebrate that with you. All right, today is a little bit different day. There are no evening ministries of any kind in terms of our regular schedule. That's because we are having this afternoon our fall frenzy starting at 3 o'clock. And um, there was some question, I haven't looked, I should have looked just before I came over here, uh, about rain, but I I think the percentage is minuscule, at least it was this morning. Uh, Ryan's going to make the official call as to whether we're going to remain outside or figure out a way to get everything in the fellowship hall or the things we can get in the fellowship hall. He's going to make that call at 1.30, and he'll post that on all the different social media platforms that our children's ministry has. I feel like we'll probably be outside. This is a great opportunity uh, to come. If you have children or grandchildren, obviously, they will have fun. They will get plenty of candy that's loaded with sugar, uh, which makes children a lot easier to handle when you get home later that day. So that's a ministry from us to you. Um, we have several inflatables out there that they'll be burning up energy on. Um, but, but one of the really cool things about this kind of event is the opportunity to have conversations with people. You know, if you're somebody that, and you're like, I don't have a child or I don't have grandchildren to bring, hey, there'll be a lot of adults here, and there'll probably be some you don't know, people from our community. Two years ago, there was a couple with their little girl. She was a tiny little thing, um, uh, Scott and Courtney Rogers, and Julie uh, is their daughter's name. Uh, they were at one of our um, fall festival things, and I met them, and we stood there and had a long talk, and uh, they actually live kind of between here and Eastman, and and um, had brought their little girl, and we talked about the church, and I said, why don't you come worship with us? And they are now members of our church. He's now playing drums in the, in the praise band uh, as, a, as a fiddle-in for when Tyler's not here, and uh, they're also working in Awana. I'm just telling you, when you come and you got people around, you have opportunity to have conversations, you just never know what might come of those, and so that's a great thing. So I'm glad God's brought us here into this moment to worship. Uh, it's really good to see. We got some of our mountain folk uh, back with us. Um, y'all home for good from the mountains until you're needed with your grandchildren or something, you know, to go back up. Glad to have y'all with us. I will always look forward to um, uh, to y'all uh, being back here with us during the uh, cold, snowy months of the year. <sighs> Three to six o'clock. Come join us today. If if it's not going to be outside. Check the Facebook page for our children's ministry at 1.30, and we'll confirm one way or the other. Father God, we gather in your presence. We love you today. We, we, if we're honest with ourselves and honest with you, which we need to be, 
Father, we oftentimes approach worship uh, with ourselves at the, at the center. And we think about what we want to get out of worship. Father, help us in this moment uh, by your Holy Spirit. Remind us that actually you're the center of this worship time. And that, Father, rather than coming with a heart to receive, we want to come with a heart to give, to give ourselves to this moment. And it's in giving that we do receive in a powerful way. So, Father, tie us together, bring us together, one body, one voice, as we worship, pour into us in music and prayer and Bible study uh, to prepare us for the week ahead of us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated on a throne high and exalted, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood seraphim, each having six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying, and they were calling out to one another. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. All the earth is full of his glory. We have been making our way in these last several weeks through a, thing, through a season we call Kingdom Tide. There's not the special emphases of Advent and Christmas, of Lent and Easter. Kingdom Tide is this time where we remember that the work of the church, the work of God through the church, carries on, even when we're not in those high and special times. This is the 21st week of Kingdom Tide. Most of the church year is, held, is, is supported through this Kingdom Tide. But even in these not-so-special weeks, we can see the Lord. We can call out and we can say, Holy is the Lord. So I invite you to stand together as we sing, To God be the glory.
the right to be called victorious. So would you continue our worship as we sing Victory in Jesus. Of the focus of a high and holy God. That's one thing that I think maybe is missing sometimes. Our church and our culture is, is the excellency, the holiness, the awesomeness, the mightiness of God. When God was trying to make a point to his people through the prophet named uh, Jeremiah, he used a very real-life illustration to make his point about how he works in the affairs of men, even his own children. It's in Jeremiah chapter 18. I want to read from there today. 
beginning in verse 1, the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord. So in other words, this is God's message to his people through Jeremiah and to his people today, people that have come to him in Christ. Arise and go down to the potter's house, and there I will let you hear my word. So I went down to the potter's house, and there he was working at his wheel. Everybody's familiar with that imagery to some degree, correct? Yeah? And the vessel he was making of clay was spoiled in the potter's hand, and the And he, the potter, reworked it into another vessel as it seemed good to the potter to do. Then the word of the Lord came to me, O house of Israel, can I not do with you as this potter has done? Behold, like the clay in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. If at any time I declare concerning a nation or a kingdom that I will pluck up and break down and destroy it. And if that nation concerning which I have spoken turns from its evil, I will relent of the disaster that I intended to do it. And if at any time I declare concerning a nation or a kingdom that I will build and plant it, and if it does evil in my sight, not listening to my voice, then I will relent of the good that I had intended to do. Now, therefore, say to the men of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, Thus says the Lord, Behold, I am shaping disaster against you, devising a plan against you. Return every one from his evil way and amend your ways and your deeds. But they say, Well, this is in vain. We'll follow our own plans and Will everyone act according to the stubbornness of his evil heart? Therefore, thus says the Lord, ask among the nations, who has heard the likes of this? The virgin Israel has done a very horrible thing. Does the snow of Lebanon leave the crags of Syrian? Do the mountain waters run dry, the cold flowing streams? But my people have forgotten me. They make offerings to false gods. They made them stumble in their ways in ancient roads and to walk into side roads, not the highway, making their land a horror, a thing to be hissed at forever. Everyone who passes by is horrified and shakes his head. Like the east wind, I will scatter them before the enemy. I will show them my back, not my face, in the day of their calamity. Man, it's a powerful passage right there about how God deals with the nations and how he deals with with us as people, because our high and lifted up mighty God is the potter. We're the clay. We trust him, but we want to make sure we're surrendered to him. Father God, as we worship in your presence, renew in us the sense of your greatness. And Father, renew in us that that truth that we can absolutely trust you in your greatness because you are holy in all things, not stained in any way. The way you lead, the way you direct is always right, true, perfect. Teach us the meaning of that in our lives as individuals walking with you in Christ, Father, renew that understanding in our nation, in our churches. Father, draw our country back to you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I was taught that our best theology always holds two extremes in tension with one another. Jesus is fully God and fully man. We don't understand it, but we hold that intention with each other. There is another set of concepts. God is transcendent, holy beyond our reckoning. But that same God loves us so deeply, so dearly, that he involves himself personally in our lives. Transcendent and imminent. Both of those things together is who God is. So we lean into that idea that he is personal to us. 
Because if he were not personal, how could we say, blessed is his name? He would be so far away. So we continue our worship singing together, oh, for a thousand tongues to sing, blessed be the name of the Lord. In the Psalms, in ancient Israel, one of the ways to acknowledge the king coming home from battle or from, uh, you know, being abroad was to raise up the gates. Lift up your heads, ye mighty gates, is, what, is one of the ways the psalmist describes it in Psalm 24. So we continue our worship. Would you stand as we, together as we sing, lift up your heads and bless the Lord, O my soul.
That was some beautiful music, wasn't it? And the choir and their offering, but also the larger choir. Those are some meaty hymns, good stuff. You have a Bible. Some of you are going to have a hard time finding this book that we're going to be in today. But there's a contents in the front of your Bible. It's going to be in Genesis chapter 1. I'll give you a minute to find that one. I want to, if I might, uh, at least for the next two Sundays, because uh, we're edging right up to... Um, Thanksgiving and the, the Advent and just so many things planned. I, I'm actually going to springboard a little bit off of the study that we're doing on Sunday nights. It started about three weeks ago. The title of the study is Culture Shock, but basically it's a look at um, absolute truth versus relative truth and is there absolute truth and what difference does it make and and so forth and so on. And within the realm of absolute truth, uh, we, most of us who are here today and maybe watching online, we understand that absolute truth is not something that you and I are able to come up with. Absolute truth has to come from one who is absolute in all things, and his name is God, Jehovah, Yahweh, the Lord. We understand that the scripture that God has given to us is that source of authoritative, absolute truth. The thing is, in the church today, I want to say more so in America than in other places in the world, but probably uh, all around the world to some degree, there, there has been a bit of backing off from the authority and the absoluteness of the truth of the Word of God. And any time you begin to back off of the absolute truth of God's Word, you are stepping into a very dangerous, dangerous area. Some would call it theological quicksand. And you won't even realize you're sinking until you look around and realize, wow, this is why God gives His truth, to protect us from the mess that we're in. Whether it's as an individual, whether it's as a nation, whether it's as a local congregation of believers. Absolute truth. When someone says out there in the bigger world around us, well, I want to speak my truth. Well, what they're saying is, I want to share my opinion. Because there really is only one source of truth. And see, that's the place where Christians need to be really clear in terms of the conversations we have with people in that those things that we stand on and we stand immovable because we're absolutely convinced of the authority and absoluteness of the truth is because these truths do not find their origin in the human mind. They find it in the high, holy, eternal mind of a God who has always been, who is, and will always be. Big difference. I love that we have magnified his greatness in our worship to this point. So we come to Genesis 1-1, because in this world of absolute truths, there are two or three that they're not more absolute than any others, but they are critical because out of these two or three flow so many of the other truths, and we can, we can gain understanding about those and insight as the Holy Spirit teaches us when we're really certain on two or three, what I call foundational absolute truths. I'm going to look at one of them today. In Genesis 1, beginning of verse 1, in the beginning. Now, this is in the beginning, not like part one of a play. This is in the beginning before anything else was begun. This is God's resume. This is God letting us know that he was before anything else was in the beginning. When there was nothing, he was. In that beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. God takes to himself right off the bat a descriptor. He is the creator. We read from Jeremiah, who in making a point to the Hebrew people and then also to us here in Cochrane today, 
His relationship to us is much like we would understand the relationship of the potter to the clay. That lump of clay does not get to sit there on the wheel and enter into a negotiation or a debate about what I should be made into. Rather, it is the prerogative of the potter, the creator, to bring life however he or she chooses in the sense of a potter. So in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth. It was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. There was a nothingness there. And God looked, and in his godness, in his vibrancy, in his power, in his holiness, he looked, and and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. The angelic host, they were looking down from eternity, what is, what is God fixing to do? And the first three words of, chapter, of verse 3 go like this. And God said. Now, what follows after that, we're not going to read all of it. I would, it would be good reading if you want to go home this afternoon. But what follows after that, after and God said is God basically speaking into existence everything with which we're familiar and, and many things with which we're unfamiliar because some of it we have not seen firsthand. He started out, let there be light. And guess what? There was light. Well, pastor, how did God do that? Don't know, not him. Can't give you any details outside of the fact that he is high, holy, and lifted up. All power resides in him. And when he says, let there be light, light shows up. Period. Well, then he looked around and he said, okay, we've got to do some separating. So he separated the waters. Created the heaven. And he created dry land earth. The waters above, the waters underneath, he separated, called it heaven, called it earth. Then he looked around and he said, we need some, some green. We need some green around here. Let there be vegetation. And vegetation was here. And, you know, in the age that we live in right now and, 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 and the, the, the technical wizardry that is you see in movies and uh, computer-generated graphics and imagery and all these kind of things. It's almost like, especially among the younger generation, they can't fully grasp that without the use of a computer, without the use of editing, without the use of Photoshop, God said, let there be light. God said, the earth shall have this form, there shall be a heaven, the water shall be separated. God said, let there be vegetation, and it's there. It's just there. In its fullness, it's there. He went on as he looked around. He said, okay, we need some celestial light. Now, that begs a question, doesn't it? That's a few verses after he said, let there be light. And now we come down a few verses, and he creates a sun, and he creates a moon, and he places them in their position. And then that is so interesting. If you go all the way to the book of Revelation, you'll find out that in the eternal home that's coming, there will be no need for a son because the holiness of God is all the light we'll ever need. And so he created the heavenly lights, the sun, the moon, the stars. He hung them in place. He put them right where they're supposed to be. I'm not going to break it down on a scientific level, but just the absolute... um, perfection of orbits and tilt of axis and all the things that allow earth to survive around that sun are amazing. There's only one who could do that. His name is God. He saw all this beautiful water. He looked down and saw the ponds around Cochrane. He said, Those, that water needs some fish. Those oceans need fish. They need waters that, uh, animals that live in the water, and there they were. All kinds. And he looked around his creation and he says, you know what? Birds flying in these beautiful skies would be amazing. 
And there they were. Then we're told he created all the beasts of the earth. And I want you to notice that there is a distinction between all those creatures that walk and crawl and live on the face of the earth and the crown of his creation, which is you and me. All of these he spoke into existence, and he said, and they were there. But then when you go on into chapter 2, and we see that when it came to humanity, God put a little of himself into that. And he formed that. And he breathed into me and you, into humanity, his very breath, the breath of life, his thumbprint in the soul of humanity. That's why <coughs> even those who reject Christ, even those who ignore God all through their life, there is something deep inside of them that still aches to know, where did I come from? And what's my purpose here? He created me and you. He is our creator. He is our creator. He creates. It is so vital to our witness, to the foundations of our faith, that we understand that this is a non-negotiable. We have been created by a creator. Let me say a couple of things about how God not how God creates, because I have no idea how he does that, but the way he creates. When God is creating from the beginning in Genesis 1-1 to this very day, number one, he creates on purpose. He's very intentional in what he is creating. Very intentional. The Bible says in Psalm 139, beginning at verse 13, as relates to his creation of humanity, he says, for the psalmist is speaking, saying, God, you formed me in my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. God creates on purpose. The idea of being knit together. I asked this in the first service, and there were very few hands that went up. Do we have any knitters in here? Got one. Do we have more than one? Got one going once, one going twice. Yeah, 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 two, got it. Tell me I'm doing an imitation of you right there. No other knitters in here? How many of you knew a knitter? Maybe your grandmother, your aunt, your friend. You know, um, it, it, it's an amazing thing. I watch people that actually knit, like serious knitters, and I'm like, I could never do that. No, number one, you have to sit still for long periods of time. I would never get it done. And really, really masterful knitters, they're doing this thing with the whatever those two things are called, what are they called, needles? They're doing this and looping and doing and up and over and doing, and they're watching TV, or they're having a conversation with you. Yeah, how about them braves? It's amazing, isn't it? And I can't even have a conversation with a knitter because I'm like, how are you doing that? Where's that go? But one of the things I love to do when somebody's in the process of knitting something and I walk up on it, I love to ask the question. I bet you know what it is. What are you, yeah, what are you creating? What are you making there? Is there a purpose in your knitting together? And always the answer is yes, I'm making a a blanket for my grandchild. I'm making a, an afghan for the back of my couch. I'm making a, 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 a cap for my son for when it's cold weather. I'm, I'm making a suit for my grandson who's a preacher. You know, just whatever. They're knitting. But there's a purpose to it. God, God tells us in Scripture that before we're actually even brought into this this life, while we're in the womb, he is busy putting us together on purpose, knitting us together for something down the road that only he knows about. That's why the psalmist says in verse 14, I praise you, I'm, I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. God creates on purpose all the way back in Genesis 1-1 and even to this day. In nature, in humanity, he has a purpose. He has a purpose. So he creates on purpose, but, but he also, especially as relates to humanity, he creates for a purpose. Jeremiah, 
in the 29th chapter, God's speaking through the prophet to his people and speaking through the prophet now to all of his children who have come to him through Jesus Christ. God says, look, I know the plans. There it is. Our creator has a plan. I know the plans I have for you. I know them. That's why I was knitted you together the way I did back in the womb, because I, I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. And so we come to this world knitted together by high and holy eternal God, and not in a random way, but he's done that on purpose, for a purpose, and that purpose has to do with his plan for our life. And so it's so critical that we understand that we have been created by a creator and that it's in that relationship that we can find and discover his purpose for our life. It's not like, and I I hear this a lot, it's not like God has created us and then once we're out in the world, he gives us a pat on the bottom and says, go, make your way, do your thing. No, no. He brings us into this world, and then we we encounter the gospel of Jesus Christ, and we realize that we're out of fellowship with our Creator because of sin, but He's made a way for us to come home through Jesus Christ, His death on the cross, His resurrection, because one of the things He's made us for is for relationship. And so we come back into relationship with our Creator, and so now we begin to discover that it's in that intimacy of relationship with God through Jesus Christ that he begins to reveal to us his calling, his purpose, his plan for knitting us together the way he did. And a lot of times I think, if I can put it this way, this is kind of a human way of putting it, but I think we can all understand it. I wonder sometimes if in my own life, if God's not standing there saying, hey, 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 Keith, Keith, this way. This, this, is, this is my plan right here. And I'm over here running as hard as I can after this dream or this passion or this desire. And I'm going down that path, and God's like, I'm not down there. That's not what I knitted you for, uh, this way. And then I fall, and I stumble, and I get bruised up and scratched and wounded. And I'm sitting there in the middle of, of that path that I chose with my little tiny mind versus the path that God's designed me for in his eternal mind. And I look at him saying, Keith, this way, trust me, this way. And I'll still get up, brush myself off, and do what? Keep running down that path. You know, and I wonder sometimes, God's like, really? But God is so patient, so full of grace, and so full of mercy. He'll let me run until I, of my own choice, come back to him and say, I'll follow you. So, okay, he creates some purpose, and and he creates us for a purpose. So how do we state that purpose? How does the Scripture state that purpose? Well, it, it's kind of, it, it's, it's like a hand and glove. I mean, they're related. Now, the biggest part of that purpose that he wants us to discover in relationship with him is so that our life might bring glory to his name. And I know that sounds simple, but God knows we need simple. We don't do well with complicated. He wants the way you live your life to be an exclamation that draws people, not to yourself, but draws the attention of people to high and holy and lifted up God in all. And they're like, wow, all this out of a relationship with a God you can't even see? Yep. It's amazing. It's amazing. The Bible puts it this way in Revelation 4.11, worthy are you, worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they exist and are created. But here's, here's, here's the amazing thing. God's created us on purpose and for a purpose, and that purpose is found in relationship with him through Jesus Christ. 
That purpose is understood in terms of living a life with Him in His shadow through Christ, whereby our life reflects glory back to God. But here, here's the amazing part. In doing that, we live in the waterfall of God's blessing on us. God wants to bless you. God, God wants to give your heart all that is hungry and thirsty for. God wants you to know security. God wants you to know a peace that passes all understanding. God wants to, to use you to influence and to impact the community and the neighborhood and, and the family that, that you inhabit and the people that you're around. God, God wants to be your strength. God wants to be your protector. He wants you to experience the overflow of his blessing in your life. The way we experience that blessing is when we're living life in his shadow and we're following a purpose that fits with his knitting together of who we are because he is our creator. I love, I love Proverbs 16, 7, where the Bible says, When a man's ways please the Lord, and my life is pleasing the Lord, and my life is pleasing to the Lord when I'm walking in his shadow and listening to him, walking submitted to him, he makes even his enemies to be at peace with him. It's blessings you can't even imagine. Again, let's go back to how a lot of us live our life. God's inviting us this way. We're going this way. We get to a place where we think things, everything's going good, and we stop because we remember, all right, I'm a Christian. Let me ask God to bless what I'm doing. God, you know where I'm at today, and God, God I just want to ask you to bless this. And God's back here going, I, I'm here, this all, all the blessings you can handle are this way. That's not my purpose for your life. You, you're going to experience a lot of frustration if you keep going that way. I can't change this because I'm the one that knitted you together. I know what I made you for. I made you on purpose for a purpose, okay? And it's this way where your life will reflect glory to me and you will run into so many blessings, it'll knock you over. Because God is our creator. Now, you know, we've got to understand some things. If we understand what the Bible says about God and his creation, his role as creator in his creation, we understand that uh, all creation answers to him. And one of the things that I, I'm hearing a lot more now in, in, the, in public discourse and then say I did 20 or 25 years ago, is people, okay, who are making life choices absolutely contrary to the Word of God, but they're saying, this is how God made me. And I'm saying, no, it's not. That is how sin has contorted God's creation in you, because that's what sin does. Sin is the great destroyer. Sin is the great deceiver. Sin, sin that Satan quickly, quickly jumped in there to get that into play in the stream of humanity all the way back in the Garden of Eden, in the book of Genesis. Sin corrupts the design of God. Oh, you're saying Satan's stronger than God? No. I'm saying sin corrupts the design of God. That's the purpose of it. That's the intent of it, which can only be corrected and healed and made right through the forgiveness of God that comes through the blood of Jesus Christ. Look at it this way. We have a creator. He is love. He is mercy. He is grace. He is wrath. He is justice. He is judgment. He is holy in all things. He is high and lifted up. He answers to no one. And yet he knows your name. He knows the number of hair on your head. He knows every tear you ever cried. 
This is our creator. He knows the number of your days before you even live them. He knitted you together in your mother's womb. That's how active he is and who you are today. But the only way to truly experience his purpose and purposes is to live life in deep, intimate fellowship with him through Jesus Christ. Here is Satan's game plan. Satan is always wanting to draw us, humanity, away from our Creator. Because it's in our Creator that we discover His purpose for us. And when we're, when we're living in God's purpose for us, we are a powerful force for the gospel of Jesus Christ. So here's, here's Satan's game plan. It hadn't changed a bit since the Garden of Eden. Number one, he wants us to look away from our Creator. He wants us to doubt what our Creator tells us. He even wants to put in the half-truth, which is really a whole lie, that maybe there's a better way, or that maybe God's keeping something from you because He doesn't want you to enjoy life or to have fun or to do whatever. Anything to keep us from focusing on our Creator, on the holiness of God. The second thing He wants to do is to seduce us away from God's purposes. He, he, he wants us to focus more on our desires and, 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 and our dreams and what, what this is my life and I, this is what I want to do with my life. And, and you've probably heard that from people before. It's a rare thing to find a Christian who understands what Paul was speaking about in the New Testament when Paul uttered as a part of his testimony the life that I now live, it is no longer I who live. It is Christ living in me. Oh, to know that kind of intimacy with the Creator. And so Satan seduces us away from the purposes as he turns our attention away from our Creator. And then Satan, he is not omnipotent. He's not all-powerful. He's not all-knowing. But man, he is a bulldog. He doesn't quit and he doesn't play fair. He knows our weaknesses, and so he constantly fuels and feeds our cravings, our fleshly cravings to chase after our own passions and our own pleasures and to, to I'll get right with God later, and to, to sow our wild oats and to just go, and it really doesn't make a difference. And, and all you got to do is, is say the formula, and you're saved, and you'll go to heaven. And man, whatever lie he can tell us to get us off track. But see, here's the end result of what Satan wants to accomplish. And I don't want you to miss this. Satan just wants to leave humanity broken, wounded, disabled, hopeless. Because, friend, do not doubt what I'm fixing to tell you. Satan cares nothing about you. You matter. You, you, you do not matter to Satan. His anger is at our Creator. Satan, who occupied the eternal realm, the heavenly realm at one time, but because he chose to try to place himself in the throne on which only high and holy God sits, he was cast out. He has hated God, and he hates that God has created a being called humanity, which even though they rebelled against him, he provided the way of redemption through Christ, who was, who was set apart from before the foundations of the world, and there is no redemption for Satan, none. And so his whole plan of revenge against the high and lifted up God is to mutilate God's prized cre creation, that's me and you. And yet we still listen to his lies. Next week we're going to look a little bit about how even just this one absolute truth, we have been created by a creator, a divine supernatural creator. How important that is, because if you understand that and receive that and wrap your heart around that, then it's really simple to look at why evolution is not even something that needs to be discussed within the context of who we are. Because it doesn't fit with who our Creator is. 
we, we are created in his image. And this is so important. So there you go. I want you to leave here knowing you're loved. He created you on purpose. And he has a great plan for you. He knows that plan. But you'll only experience that in relationship with him. And this high, holy, and lifted up God, even knowing his crown jewel of creation would rebel against him, he stuck with the plan. He sent a Savior. And he says to all, I want you to come home. Through Jesus, who paid the price. And it's in that relationship now that those things that sin has twisted or gnarled up, he restores. He brings back into us this understanding of this is what I've been made to do for his glory. Yeah? Let's stand up. We're going to have a closing prayer. We'll be dismissed. I pray that maybe during this week, the, it's really just the incredible truth that you have been created by an eternal, all-powerful, holy God. You have been created not at a mass production facility, but he knitted you together in your mother's womb. If he's going to put the time in for that, trust me that he has a plan for your life. Father God, we, we leave now. And I pray the peace of your presence, the hope of your presence on each person in this room, the families, the homes they represent, those watching online. Father, help us to recognize how desperately we, the people of God, need to stand on the, the absolute foundations of biblical truth, to stand on those with great compassion, with great grace and love for the world around us, but still standing true. Father, I ask you to um, just give us all, all of us who come this afternoon, an opportunity to just build a relationship, especially with people we don't know, to maybe meet some people in our community and let them see the face of Christ uh, in our conversations. We love you, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.